animators and artists. Julia Scholl and Birgit Polo Ulig are the co-creators behind The Legend of Pee Pee, a SCAD thesis film which follows a raggedy little cat on a dangerous quest to rescue the Cat Kingdom's princess who was kidnapped by a horrifying beast. The Legend of Pee Pee has been viewed 4.8 million times on YouTube since the short's debut in July, and we invited Julia and Polo onto our live stream to discuss the craft that went into the project from storyboards to production. So Julia, Polo, welcome to the live stream. Hi, thank you for having us. We're so excited. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. So can you start by introducing yourselves and describing your roles on The Legend of PP? Yeah, so, so I'm Julia Scholl. I'm the creator and director of the film. Um, but I had my hands in all parts of the film, as did Polo. Um, I'm from Alabama, but I for college, I moved to Savannah, Georgia. Um, and then after college, I moved to LA. So that's where I am currently. Yeah, my name is uh, Birgit Ulig, but uh, all my friends here in the area call me Polo for ease of pronunciation. Um, I am from Germany. I grew up in Germany, spent my entire life in Germany. But then for college three years ago, I moved to California to study animation. And um, Jewel and I met on the production of PP. And I started out as a storyboard artist to help with some of the story, but then I slowly slipped into the role of a co-director as I started helping more and more in the film. And I too, especially towards the end, had my hands on pretty much every facet of production from pro from producing to actual like animation. All right, so let's get into it. Um, and we'll start by discussing the visuals broadly. Um, what was the thought that went into this like big grand tapestry that introduces the story? All right, let me, let me go to that on my... Do a whole section for that in my little slides. Let's go. So, here, let me find it. All right. So, the idea behind the tapestry is to create a sense of like subversion off the bat. Um, this was inspired by Kung Fu Panda. I like DreamWorks always has the most amazing movie openings, um, and I loved how they immediately subverted people's expectations and kind of set forth that uh, motif or motif in the film. And that was what I want to do with PP, as well as creating an instant hook and kind of introducing you to like the time period through the like medieval type tapestries. Um, but I'll let po Polo talk about that because she was the one who made it. Like, made it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, this is actually the first part of the film where I helped on it. Um, I started. This is where I started. I started out as um, just responsible for boarding the. Uh, part of production that is the tapestry. And here is the actual animatic for the tapestry. Yeah, this was all Polo. This yeah, is uh, this the was, first thing she did for the film. Yeah, which is the general idea was just that we wanted to have like an old medieval style tapestry that like rolls out and we have a cool 3D um, pan happening with different uh, layers and all that with very smooth motion graphics. Yeah, everything, no, no, like cuts and shots, everything flows into each yeah, other. Yeah, exactly. That was the whole like idea behind it. And then we have this epic fight of um, the cool Pee Pee Kiss. Yeah, Pee Pee Kiss. Yeah, yeah. His, name, his name is Pee Pee Kiss of awesome Pee Pee Kiss, um, slaying the three headed dragon and holding them up, winning the princess. She gives him a smooch and then it pans down to reveal what yeah. Pee Pee really is. The idea here is to kind of show um pp's Pee ego and his delusion with himself to see like show you what he thinks he is and what he thinks he deserves versus what he actually is and um this these were actually done by one of our um friends who helped on the film named jess mcginnis um she did the initial color composition for every single one of the slides which is what you see right now and um yeah here this was the first roughs we did some we had um a friend named sujin help us with the general design of each slide i pretty much i mainly did the what i did was the, the storyboarding and then the directing on it but every single part of it was handled by different individuals so i had my own little group of tapestry people that i worked with very closely to get it to the point that it actually is at now. Um, here, this is, these are the final slides on it. Uh, what we did was we 
uh, I ended up after like Jess's pass on the colors, I ended up redoing some of them and like going over them again, just to add more atmosphere and more um, flow and more storytelling to it based off of what Jess provided. Mostly drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah mostly drama. drama. I very much up the drama because I wanted it to feel as dramatic and intense as possible compared to what the film actually is going to be. So that to really push that subversion. Um, the tapestry painting style was inspired by old medieval paintings with a lot of like those small intricate details that and like those repeating patterns that um, the old tapestries like medieval European times would have. But we also wanted to like make it feel more modern than that and more colorful and cartoony than that. So um, this is what we ended up coming up with. And that was actually a full team process because I had a vague idea of what I wanted it to look like. And then um, I had three different passes on the first slide here. The first slide is actually entirely painted by me. And I did that three or four different times, completely separately, completely overthrowing what I had, just to like try and figure out what style seems to work best and is easiest to replicate. And then as we move forward, um, the individual painters and the artists, I actually encouraged them to put in some of their own creativity on like what kind of patterns to use, how to use the brush set that I gave them to create different patterns and stuff. So there was a lot of room for creativity there. Yeah, then, they, they did amazing. <laughs> yeah, they did amazing. Like it really came together with it, all of the artists. Um, and then at the very end, the final sliding and everything um, was also done by me because I really wanted to make sure that um, the final composition was that all of the motion graphics were gonna look as smooth as possible, as humanly possible in After Effects. <laughs> so um, we had, we had them done for the first pass of the film by our motion graphics artist, but um, because we, when we first submitted the film to SCAD, we had to rush a lot to get these things done. And then for the final submission to YouTube, I ended up redoing that part to match it very closely to the boards. And um, yeah, that is the final pro like the final product of it. And yeah. I also did the character animation on the three-headed dragon and the because slaying the three-headed dragon the, was a big challenge of making him come from the tapestry out into the presence to slay the dragons. And um, I don't think we have a slide for that, but that's yeah. fine. Um, and that was especially like compositing struggle, but um, yeah. 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 <laughs> so there's this big grand tapestry and it's contrasted with the next scene where you meet the scraggly little cat. Exactly. Yep. We wanted to build that contrast as much as possible. Yeah, even like with the art direction, I think you have the, where, where is the back, we have the background somewhere. Yeah, because background. if you compare just like the feeling of the tapestry and the feeling of the grand castle here to the interior, like see how like this still feels dramatic, but it feels more soft, more inviting, more warm. And for that, the shots you see are very gruesome, scary, high contrast, evil dragon. So we kind of wanted to push like the feeling there too with the contrast between them. Yeah. So I want to talk about Pippi's, char Pippi's character design um, because in a lot of media where you see cats, cats are these sort of graceful, dignified beings. And Pippi, Pippi is a very different um, type of cat. Yeah, so like uh, to me, cats are not graceful. There's nothing graceful about cats. They're like <laughs> silly goofy if, if you own a cat you know they're not graceful um they make weird expressions and they're very their their moods are very much like a light switch like you can pet them and they're they're being sweet and nice and then you touch their stomach and they like attack you and you're their number one enemy and i really wanted to capture um that energy with pp so um he actually like this first design right here um this was just me being a call of friends and they were like oh we're gonna play D, D in like five minutes so make a character really quick um and this just popped out which is his or origin story little did i know that would change the trajectory of my life forever um but as we um as we decided to develop a film um, i had to take this design and we had to find out a way to simplify it and streamline it for the animators because this first design would not be easy for a lot of people to come on and just immediately animate it. He's got a lot of line mileage, not like super slow shape language. So um, that is also where Polo came in, um, if you want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I think that was like the second thing that I helped on aside from the boards was um, Julia came to visit in California when she still lived in Savannah. And um, 
we all hang, hung out at a friend's house to work together. And Jewel and I were literally just all day, we were sitting next to each other working on PP. Like we really bounced off of each other. And I remember that being also like one of our first bonding experiences because yeah. we both like had so much fun, like talking about his design and talking about his shape language and stuff. And that's where I came in because I ended up making his design a lot more cartoony, a lot rounder, a lot more, um, easy to turn around and yeah, uh, like replicate. Yeah, he turned into a marketable plushie. Yeah, he very much immediately turned into a marketable <laughs> plushie because I um, just wanted to make sure for ease of um, production to make him look, so you can see like, you can see pretty clearly like here, he just has like big like general shapes that are all repeating so that people when they animate him could pretty much just use these shapes and like move them around so that it can cons like, all the time stay consistent we removed some of the details like the little like circles on his skirt and his um shoulder plates just things like that to make it just a little bit easier to something i want to add that um something i was very valuable i learned from that experience was just that like polo added this light gray into the chest plate um hmm. because when you look at it with like blurred eyes it's so much easier to see the silhouette of his face against his chest when he has the light gray and for me like i've been so used to seeing people with the dark gray i was like that looks odd that looks so weird but now it it works so well it's it's, it's very like that kind of design language was a very valuable learning aspect um while developing him and it also goes back to the 12 principles of animation where you have solid drawing drawing volumes uh to understand how characters are structured um, so I, I think that's a really uh, great use of, of a character design. Yeah, like if 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 we were to go with this first design of PP, it would have, like, I don't know another word to describe this other than like a new grounds feel where like they can change and be off model for the sake of humor, um, which is something I like. But when you're working on a, a big team and trying to make one cohesive product, that is, it is very hard to quality yeah. control. And make things feel cohesive unless you have a character that has like structure and a way that it can turn around so people can understand it using logic um, instead of just the principle of appeal is there anything else that we want to talk about uh pp's character design right now let's see i think mainly just that i remember when i was talking to jewel um pp started out as like a lanky long scrungly thing and I remember when I talked to her and she explained the story to me, I was the one saying, we should make him very, very round and very small and very cute, mm -hmm. just so that people are actually really shocked when he ends up being very mean. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of where his direction went. Like you see in the three passes here, how he went cuter and cuter and smaller and smaller. That was the idea behind it. Yeah, just to even further push the that subversion. Yeah. And there's some challenging aspects too with this character design where you have like asymmetry, where you have the bandaged leg and the armored leg and the notch in one ear. Uh, those are things that can always be challenging in a production. Oh yeah, I am i don't, honestly haven't gone through and seen if like his ear notch switches. We had to does. like very consistently try to like quality control that and make sure that didn't happen. Um, I'm sure somewhere he's, he's- I mean alone like in the first, like, I don't know if it's like here somewhere, but we have like the, sheet with his poses, oh, yeah. his pose sheet. Hold on, I have that. Yeah, we have the sheet where I drew out his poses and different expressions because Jewel asked me to um, make, after I did the newest like turnaround, asked me to show some of his expressions. And in that sheet alone, I switch it up all the time because while I'm drawing, I flip my drawings back and forth. And then in order to compose them all into one sheet like this, I ended up switching them around and flipping them around. So it's super inconsistent which side his ear notch is on and which one <laughs> it isn't. Like, um, yeah, like the one way he's face planting, the ear notch is on the wrong side. Um, the knee is on the wrong side. Actually, oh, I tried to get it here. Yeah, this is, there's like so many consistencies, even in like this official sheet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, the asymmetry is important in, in character design, but it's also difficult yeah, in the production. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you rely uh, on flipping your canvas 30 times while sketching. Yeah. Another question I had was um, with the pupils. So, so PP is a character who has these really big black round pupils. Um, what was your intention with with the sort of expression that uh, he's giving? Um, I wanted to give him a sort of blankness. Um, that's I I think um, 
I did this like this cat internet cat hadn't been around when I first started it, but it's a perfect example of it. If anybody knows Jinx the cat, um, just that like kind of void and that that feel of emptiness I felt would help add to um, PP. Just not it, it would help make it believable that he doesn't understand what's truly going on around him. Um, because like when he's confronting the king, when he's confronting the demon. Um, he does not have an actual reaction to it. He's completely oblivious to the danger. And uh, if we gave him a more present, like, personality or look to him, it might feel odd that he doesn't react to it the way he should. So we just really wanted to make him feel airheaded. Um, and that was kind of the intention of giving him big And also, pupils. you know, like, when you see a cat and they have, like, their small... Because cats have slit pupils, they look too serious and too scary. So um, we wanted to make PP look like he's constantly in the dark with his pupils all the way dilated and also a little playful because, you know, when cats are all playful, their pupils are huge. So that is also where that came from. Yeah, I'm trying to find like, I don't know if I want to find it, but some, at some point in production, um, we were doing cleanup and somebody accidentally like filled his eye color wrong and he looked so demonic. Where is it? <laughs> yeah, when he was like, uh, or even with smaller pupils, he looks like a different character. Yeah. It I love that. Nice. I'll just pull it up if I do find it. So, um, we're talking about the character of Pee Pee, we're talking about juxtaposing uh, the, uh, the tapestries with the character. How would you describe the storyboarding process behind Legend of Pee Pee? Oh boy, so I learned a lot the storyboarding process because um, for me, that was that was probably the most. Um, what, what's I started like for the first like month or two, I was doing that alone, and I'd never boarded a comprehensive story before. Um, I had only boarded little like segments of of scenes and stuff like that through like classes. Um, I actually I did all the boarding in harmony because I knew the board needed to be done quick and it needed to be efficient, and I could just work fastest in harmony. So instead of going with, like storyboard pro, I just um, did every scene there, um, which worked out because I also knew how to use the cameras um, best in that at the time. Um, and if I could tell anybody making a film anything, or if I could go back and tell myself anything, it'd be to do the whole first rough of your pass with like stick figures. Like don't try to make it impressive. Don't try to make good drawings. Yeah. Just try to get the like staging and the ideas there because the PP board graveyard is massive. Like there's so many like fully realized drawings and segments that I just had to trash because the story didn't work. And that's the most important part to keep in mind when you're boarding, not the drawings. You don't have to have good drawings for a storyboard, um, which I wish I could go back in time and tell myself. But um, that was a huge learning curve for me. Um, I, we actually had, so like we had a deadline for the boards and after getting everything, all, all the boards together, um, watching the whole film, I realized that all of Act 2, like the pacing just was not working. Um, it just kind of felt, instead of the whole film feeling cohesive, it, it kind of felt segmented because of the pacing of Act 2. So a week before the deadline, I completely scrapped it. And me and Polo and my friend um, Yusuf, like just for a week, worked all night just redoing the entire thing. Um, because what had happened is we found um, a really good temp song for it. It was like a SpongeBob song um, for the storyboard. And we were like, this the BPMs of this, like the energy is exactly what we need for the pacing. So we scrapped everything and we boarded it out to the song, like the temp song. And then um, our composer, or later when our composer came in, um, Brian Tiok, I think is how you say his last name. I should double check that. But um, he's amazing, by the way. He, just blew everything out of the water but we were like okay you need to match the exact bpm of this spongebob song and he did and it, like everything worked out um but that's that's how we ended up getting the pacing to work is that we found a song with the pacing and we boarded to the beats of that song yeah i remember <clears throat> we had three passes on that act two and then our friend yusuf did the first rough pass of it to like who he designed like the first like the general idea of what's supposed to happen action wise and then i went over it and cleaned up all of the boards and redid them to match the music and to um give pp like all of the like acting that you see in act two where he like reacts to the princesses and all that and like reacts to everything i wanted to make him like super expressive there and follow the beat and um 
yeah, that was like the, I think that was still like in the beginning when I first came in and started mm -hmm. helping and I was, uh, give, I gave people like a bunch of little actions and all that. Yeah, Polo added a lot of, um, a lot of personality to PP. When I first started out, my kind of idea for him was just to kind of be a very like static character, um, not super responsive, um, just very blank, but she made him like angry and <laughs> passive aggressive and just kind of like- Yeah, like, like I said, I wanted the, I wanted the, to push the contrast between him being like, looking like the cute marketable plushie to being like a little like, just mean. Little gremlin. Yeah, yeah. like a little like mean gremlin. Like this is how cats kind of are. Exactly, yeah. They're, they're yeah. selfish. <laughs> and I think I, I love that character trope. I think like characters that are just like needlessly mean, even though they have no right to be, or like needlessly like egocentric, even though they have no ground to stand on it. That makes me laugh so much. It's one of my favorite tropes, which is why I started making that bleed into PP. Yeah. So I saw a really good question in the chat. Uh, Zoe Marson is asking. Uh, was there anything cut from the board's original script that you wish you had more time, uh, or if you had more time, you would have kept? That's a good question. Also, hi, Zoe. Zoe's one of our background artists. She was like a <laughs> creative. Like, she was like one of our background artists. Yeah. Um, that's a good question, though. I, I did have some, originally, I wanted to work more of the PP -pee kiss stuff in throughout the film, like kind of as PP -pee imagining how he would approach situations, which is how he actually does. Um, we had to cut that, and I think it ended up working that we cut that. I don't think that was super necessary. Um, I think everything we cut was necessary, and there's there's not really anything that we didn't keep in that I felt like, oh, man, it would have plus the film so much if we kept this in. Um, I think story in the process of creating a storyboard is a lot of, um, like, rejecting the n not, like, super necessary ideas and kind of taking off the rose-tinted glasses and being like, okay, this is what will be possible down the line. Because when you're boarding, you can think of the most ambitious stuff, but later on, when you think about um, the, the, like, animation pipeline, the deadlines, you have to approach it a bit more realistic and cut some corners. Um, so there's nothing I regret taking out, but there are some things, like, that sure might have, like, plussed some of the visuals. Um, but for the time frame we had, I'm I'm good with everything. Kept yeah, in. I'm so <laughs> happy with everything that it like with it, how everything came out in the end because the film's almost ten minutes long. I don't think like it's we didn't really like skimp out on anything, especially just because it is so long. We really like just kept everything that we wanted in. We left it in. Speaking of which, um, for the people here who are looking to make a film, um, I wanted to say um, one of the general rules with making a, a film and making it achievable realistically is to have as little settings as possible. So don't do what we did. <laughs> don't do 12 like, settings. They, these are all different settings. We all have, we had to think about like, these all have to have different um, color scripts, which um, big thanks again to Jessica McGinnis for helping us with those color scripts. Um, she's the one who did this huge panning background painting. Um, but we had so it's many gorgeous. ambitious settings. It is, yeah. And the background team absolutely killed it. Like, I still can't believe how good these backgrounds came out. Um, so much talent. Uh, but all of these different settings had to, we had to, like, do different color scripts. We had to make sure they were distinctive and readable. That was a huge part of it, uh, is to make sure when the characters are in the scene, you can see the characters. And uh, since that's the most important part, uh, the characters have to be the most visible. Um, like all of these panning shots were ridiculously ambitious. Um, yeah, like, especially like the if, if you zoom into this one, it's like a Where's Waldo. Like it's you can see all the buildings and uh, th that was uh, Charles Kugler, who was one of our layout artists who did the lines for this um, and just like plus it by a million compared to my idea for it. Um, but yeah, just don't don't put twelve different settings in your film like we did. Um, <laughs> that was a, took a lot of time and a lot of hours from a lot of people. Um, I'm, I don't regret it. I'm super proud of all the backgrounds everybody did, but um, yeah, heed my warnings with that. <laughs> it's, it'll take a lot of time. So a, a little bit earlier on, you mentioned um, that there were different acts in your film. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about what the different acts in the film were and how you developed them? Yeah, so um, we had the first act was us introducing the, the conflict and the world. Um, I knew that with the first act, I wanted to, to really hook people within the first couple seconds of the film and also create that subversion um, since that was gonna be 
kind of a, a motif, a theme of the film um, throughout. So um, the first act was the easiest for me because that one had the most like structured rules. Like, oh, we have to introduce the characters. We have to introduce the world and the conflict. The second act was blank in my head. I knew what, what I wanted, but I didn't know um, all the little pieces I needed for it. I knew I wanted like a quick paced montage. I didn't know what to do for the gags yet. I just had a broad concept. Um, act three was another easy one for me. I knew how I wanted the film to resolve. Um, it had some, I struggled a bit with it because it, the original film had a different resolution. Um, and the dragon was not a huge part of it. Um, originally I was going to make the, um, third act of the film kind of like the the peak conflict be like just pp trying to traverse up the castle with like avoiding for booby traps and all this kind of like slapstick stuff um but in the end we ended up making the dragon the big like centerpiece um the final part of the film and that was that wasn't too difficult act two was um a nightmare for me at first like um it was so war driven um and I didn't know exactly how to approach the pacing. So I had my friend um, Dominic Romano come in and he came up with um, all of the base gags and um, worked out kind of like the settings for those. And then later um, Yusuf and Polo um, ha had to fix the um, the pacing because we kind of boarded, when I boarded Act 2 with Dominic, we weren't doing it with the other two acts uh, before and after it. We were doing it kind of in a void. And once we put that in, we were like, oh, we did this in a void, so we didn't notice the pacing was a little off. So um, then we just fixed the pacing a little bit. Um, and added all those character acting bits and stuff and all those little gags. Yeah, yeah. the gags were mainly Yusuf. Yusuf did a great job with like the silly little gags. It was really funny. And it gave me a lot of room to play with when I went over it again and started giving people all the funny, evil personality that he has now. Yeah. Why don't we talk about some of the um, moments where that personality comes out? Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about some of those gags? Yeah. So the first okay. one is the slap. Yeah, first one's a slap, and that that one's that one's funny because um, originally I just had like my idea was just to have PP like step over her, and then my a professor who saw it, um, John Weber, was like, "You need to like punch up this to like." really make it read that PP is disregarding her. So I like boarded a slap, but when me and Yusef were editing the timing, we accidentally like cut the clip way too close together and it made the slap turn from like five frames to one frame. So it was just like immediate and that made us laugh so hard. So that's actually where like that really quick slap came from. Like it was just a boarding accident, um, but we thought that was so funny. Um, um, the next one, God, I'm not trying to mentally go through the film first. Okay, actually, I think the first one is where he has the princess. Uh, so he has the princess posters talking to the king, and but without even listening to the king, he just leaves. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and that actually was so. Throughout the film, PP is holding up a poster um, to compare the crowns because he's he's not aware enough to he doesn't have like very good facial recognition, so he just uses the crown on the poster to compare the princesses. And in that first scene, when he's talking to the king, he's actually just comparing the crowns and he realizes that's not the princess, so he leaves. He's not even like listening at all to the king. <laughs> but um, after that, a lot of that, those little moments came in when Polo was montage, boarding the yeah. montage. I, was kind of, I can find that really quick. I put my little like um, soft spot for me and characters in that with him. Like every time like he didn't find the right princess, he would see that she's in, in trouble, but not even act, recognize that there's like someone in danger like absolutely no empathy he just leaves and i'm um, so like in that one our friend abby who animated the shot with the giant snake um abby actually added in a little sigh and groan he like rolls mm -hmm. his eyes and turns around and then um what else um oh and the the mole princess in the hole he just looks at it he sees that the princess isn't the right one and then he lets the princess burn up into a crisp yeah here i've got the lock animatic that i can show the oh yeah the act two and yeah here yes yeah, so these are there. the parts that polo boarded and added some little snarky personality into yeah 
Yeah, these are great. Yeah, these are amazing. Philip killed it with these. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so originally it was just him getting angry and walking out, but um, our animator, um, Abby Snyder, plussed it more by giving him like an annoyed little groan. Yeah, like eye roll. Um, and, then and then this was a big part where his personality came through too. <laughs> but he commands the demon. <laughs> In pairs, no. Nope. And he gets angry and walks off, which is because like when I was talking to Poe about the scene, I thought he would just kind of like blankly walk away, but she added this. This angry. Little yeah, angry I also added one. the bit where he um, points at the demon to do what he did because I, I I remember like boarding these and just being like, this would be so funny if he did this, and I did that with every single like moment I could. <laughs> And then for this one, it's a little less um, pessimism and more just like, like here, like the, the mood goes up a little bit again. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, all right, this is it. Just yep, he's like, this ground. is not it again. Yeah, but here we actually had a match to the SpongeBob montage music. That yeah, I wonder if this has the, the SpongeBob music I was talking about. Let me check. Oh, oh yeah, there we go. Hopefully I'm not sure if that comes through. Oh my bad. I yeah, it probably just doesn't. Okay. Oh, well. Well, you can imagine it. <laughs> yeah. SpongeBob music. All right. You, you know, even that first gag of PP walking off as the king's talking to him, it, it kind of reminds me like when um, a friend of mine's playing a video game and there's like a character giving exposition. He's like, no, I'm bored. I'm going to walk away. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly, yeah. Yeah. And for that, I. We had to, that was another thing actually. Um, let me see if we can pull it up. We had to keep this King segments really brief because he is a very complicated character to animate and clean. Like his cleanup sheet was insane. Um, so I wanted to find ways to like cut his scene short and that it just honestly worked out um, perfectly that way. But here, let me check our files. See if I can find that guy. So this was his, um, his insanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because he had all these different like lines and stuff, like the colored Details. lines and bits. Yeah. yeah. The cleanup of them wasn't crazy. Yeah. So um, that's another thing to keep in mind when you're like boarding a film is if you know you have these ambitious, hard to animate and clean up characters, try to keep them to a minimum. Which we didn't. <laughs> we did with him. He has like three shots. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so speaking of uh, character designs, um, which of the creatures or character designs did you find was the most interesting and rewarding to work on? So for me, I think that would be both the Minotaur and the dragon. Um, so for, this like film was very indulgent for me. Um, I love cats and dragons. Like all my friends know that's like my thing. And I just made a film about cats and dragons because I wanted to draw that. I didn't want to spend a year animating and drawing something that I didn't think was fun. Um, so being able to design the dragon was just very self-indulgent for me. Um, I wanted to, oops, I wanted to make her feel kind of like a, a chicken. Um, <laughs> And I was also looking at like, like those funky little greyhounds, like Jenna Marvel's dogs, and trying to get that like blank feel from them too. Um, <laughs> so wrinkly faces. Yeah, she well, started out. Looking. Yeah, exactly. Um, she started out like this, um, which has um, a lot of line models, just not very friendly to animators. Um, and that was originally because she had a very small part in this film. Like she was just going to be sitting in the room um, with the crown and. The, the blood on her face and that's how PP like PP would recognize she was like dead and just the princess was dead and leave. Um, but later it developed into PP misconstruing her for the princess um, with like the thinking the blood is lipstick 
and having the, the crown of the princess on since he's only using that bit, that poster to compare the, the crowns to see if the princesses. Um, so she got a much bigger part of the film later on. Um, and I redesigned her to give her a bit more structure so that people could understand how to like move her in space. But she was still a very difficult character for people to draw understandably because like when you have so little time to get familiar with the character and they are um, have this much line mileage, um, it takes a while to be able to draw them on model. So um, I went in and keyed most of the shots of the dragon just to make sure everything was feeling consistent. Um, but she was just the most fun for me because she was the most indulgent. Um, I really wanted to make a, a big kind of like heavy lumbering alligator type creature. Um, and I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but other than that, the Minotaur also was really fun for me. Oh, wait, he's right there. That's convenient. Um, <laughs> the Minotaur was really fun. And um, it was interesting score because we actually did a 3D skull for the Minotaur. Um, but in the beginning, I like I didn't know how to animate in 3D. I knew how to use Blender, but I didn't know how to go about like animating his rig. So I actually, uh, this was like the first shot uh, I had tested out for PP. This was like the first ever finished shot and it changed a lot. This is like an old background. But um, for this, I we had brought with my 3D model or created a, a 3D model of the skull. And then I animated the rough and tune boom. And then instead of animating the skull in Blender, I um, we got a transparent PNG sequence turnaround. And I imported every frame of that turnaround into Toon Boom and kind of treated it like almost like a puppet. Like I used the um, the library, the substitution library to um, swatch out different head views of the 3D model. So this is all, this is like this 3D turn in space with 3D model is all just like me swatching images in Toon Boom. Um, and it worked oh, really well. Wild. Yeah, like I, I got the idea from Felix Colgrave actually, because I was following his Patreon at the time and he was doing that with in Flash. Um, because he also didn't like uh similarly just didn't want to have to learn animating <laughs> in a, a new program like Blender, like I didn't either. So he found a workaround where he could just um do that in Flash and I tried that out with Toon Boom and it, it worked out great. Um so that was really fun. Um we for the rest of the film we had 3D animators, so for other shots we could um, do blender animation, but for me, being too stubborn to learn it, um, this worked out really well. Yeah. But um, yeah, the Minotaur was really fun. Um, another indulgent character. Um, just kind of came out really quick, and I was like, "Yep, that's the design," because I thought it'd be fun. Um, but what about you, Polo? Um, for me, it was okay. So my whole thing is just creature design in general. I love designing different creatures, playing with the funny shapes they can have and um, just like exploring what kind of shapes like communicate what kind of personality. Um, yeah. So first, before I'm going to talk, before I'm talking about people, because I'm actually going to talk about um, the characters that I did for the montage. I don't think they're in here. They're not in here. This is so yeah, we can, we can both, both. Um, <laughs> So Imaginations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we just assume everyone has seen the film and knows it as well as we do. Um, so I, I, um, designed all the little, very offhandedly, I had to design them very quickly because, um, we just didn't have a character designer on them and I boarded it out. So I figured, okay, I might as well just do it because I know the intention of the scene be best. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm watching Jewel trying to find the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> file. Um, and I, uh, I think I had the most fun designing here we go here this is the yeah here it is so the demon character was actually initially designed by um by dominic who we were talking about earlier that was actually that was yusuf oh that was yusuf i thought okay okay never mind it was yusuf yusuf designed the demon guy and then when i redrew it i went over it and tried to like push his scariness um i just gave him like these huge plentiful sharp teeth giant scary eyes we jewel and i were like going back and forth on how to color him and we settled on making him all black and just giving him glowing red lines <laughs> to make him look, like, as comedically scary as possible like i really had a lot of fun like making his expression insane and like scary 
And then the moment Pipi like points, he looks all like neutral and like friendly. But then he turns to the rat and he goes. <laughs> and he gets a generous one. <laughs> he gets even scarier when he turns to the rat. So I had a lot of fun with that. This character was a lot of fun for me to draw. Um, Again, self indulgent. Like we just did what we. Yeah, I love. I love just pushing his expressions to like absolute like stupidity when I can. I don't do it that <laughs> very often, but here it was like I definitely had a lot of fun with that. Same with like the rat, like when the rat is being dragged in, you see the face here, like, I love doing that, it was so much fun. <laughs> and same with, like, the shape of the rat, like, it's just, it's just a triangle to kind of push the evilness. <laughs> and it's actually a lady, um, she is... Lady rat, yeah, yeah she's a lady. eyelashes later on. Yeah, here, when you, when she, you see her being squeezed, um, here, let's see if I can find the f single frame. Oh, no. There. Yeah, here, you can you see, can hardly see it. you can hardly see it, but she has a little eyelash <laughs> because it's a lady rat. And we thought it was funny to make all the characters, um, all the characters that are like being slapped away by PP. They're all female. Yeah, we wanted to like we were like let's just make all the the characters like PP screws over female to yeah. really like to even, kind of give the he's really failing at being a knight in shining armor. He really uh, is like, saving princesses and stuff. Yeah, he doesn't save anyone. No, no girls were saved in this movie. <laughs> um, I also like the chameleon. The chameleon was designed by the chameleon was actually designed by Adama initially, and then mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun going off of his design to, I don't know, give her that um, magical vibe because I I like the chameleon for this scene because it's like enchanted it's like we have like a wizard like a sorcerer there and then the chameleon feels just like magical enough to fit in there and that's kind of something i like to keep in the back of my head to see what kind of character would fit into the scene i love this kind of analytical thinking when it comes to these things um and then the same with the spider the spider was awesome i love drawing the spider and the mole um i i have i don't usually draw like these kinds of like designs but it was really fun like branching out and like trying different things and i wanted to draw a spider that um is scary like a spider but people who have like a horrible phobia of spiders don't yeah. lose it when they see it <laughs> so this is like a nice in between with like the cute little spider paws and stuff and still trying to make it scary and ominous with the red glowing eyes and then the mole princess was fun too because they're just all these different shapes and characters um, and then the other thing that um, I got to do was I redesigned um, Pipikus because um, we his shots were actually the ones that we did the very last. Um, this was his original design, which was awesome. I love this design. This was the design I also used in the boards, but when we had to get the film done and it was my turn to do the character yeah, animation. We had like three days left. We had three days. I had three shots started. Yeah, I had three days to finish his shots. And it was the whole like sequence of Pipikas jumping out of the tapestry, doing a little um, somersault and then slaying the three headed dragon. That was a lot to animate in three days. And I went to Jewel and I was like, I can't, I can't draw it. I, this has so much line mileage. I cannot track all of that. I am so sorry. <laughs> so I simplified it a lot. I also like, made it more shapey and more graphic to at least like try to like match it into the tapestry i think looking back i probably could have put a little more thought into it but we really were like short on time so it this was not one scene so yeah exactly we, were, so we weren't too worried this is what um i came up with, with with his design which was a lot of shapes that flow into each other for um sake of clarity and communication um i ended up making his cape transparent because i did so much character animation on his back which would have all been hidden by his cape so i refused to like have that be lost and i made his his cape have a little fade in the final comp and um yeah this character is also a lot of fun to work on because it's very big broad um heroic shapes yeah i think that's like and what you just talked about is kind of a um was a pattern of this film like i would come up with these um these ideas and concepts and uh you would come in and rationalize them and streamline them yeah and make that was kind of more uh, context yeah because you would name for this film yeah you had like awesome brainstorming ideas and then i would be like but hmm, maybe we can like do this to like fit it into the film really well yeah yeah you were like more, she, she was a little always my anchor for making this film like achievable which is very essential I wanted to ask before we run out of time, uh, how do you describe the uh, film's animation pipeline and what kind of guidance did you give to other artists working on the project? 
All right, so we have a, we brought in our most difficult shot to show our pipeline. In harmony. Um, in harmony, let me see. All right, so it was this this blaster shot and all the rest were done by Polo. Um, no. I'll go through the, the roughs first um, and then I'll show um, how we approach cleanup. Do right, you me, do that or? Oh yeah, you can do that. Let me just turn off. Yeah, I don't um, know how, to, how you set up this one. Let me just turn off effects real quick. All right. All right. So first I will we'll start by playing the rough. Okay, so let's play smooth. Right. Um, oh, sounds getting shot, but this was difficult because there's so many zoom ins and so the, many characters. The most, there. like the most zoomed in shot, has to be the 1920 by 1080 like resolution. So when it's zoomed out to show the whole thing, the canvas is massive. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like twelve thousand pixels or more. Yeah. It's huge. So we actually had. Um, God, we had, I think we had five, it's six different people um, on the scene at the end for the polo for cleanup. And then um, I think it was four people, no, sorry, polo for yeah, rough I animation. Cleanup, I think point. it was four different people for cleanup and then one person um, rough animating, or not sorry, effects animating. And I'll go into um, the different steps of that, or you can go into the different steps of that and I'll just move my or navigate the Toon Boom. Yeah, this Toon Boom file was like when I was animating this. This was actually my first time animating, doing rough animation in Toon Boom. So um, I figured it out really relatively quickly because the controls on Toon Boom are very intuitive for me because I came from a flash background and I was actually thankful for how animator friendly Toon Boom is. The tool of being able to select singular lines and stuff saved me because I had to animate this 30 plus second shot with four characters. No, is it four? Yes, four characters. Yeah, no. <laughs> yes, it's four. Yeah, yeah, with four characters in under three weeks and that alongside full-time school. So um, yeah, the tools and Toon Boom really like made it achievable. Like, I don't think I would have not been able to do that that quickly in any of my other animation software. Um, and I just started out by doing like the rough, uh, the keyframes. At first I did like a super rough pass for everything, which kind of already was the animatic that I did because the animatic was already keyframed pretty much. And then I just went in and drew the keyframes, which you can see like this one, for example, it has a little K next to it and it has some black outlines. So tidy it up. And then I just like, went from there. I did it character by character. I think the first one that I animated was PP. I did all the um, rough swap PP, then I did um, the rat, then I did the princess, and then I did the demon. And um, that reflects like our whole process. So we would always have our animators start out with keys and send the keys in before they can move on with in-betweens. That way we could catch any model errors um, or any staging errors or anything like that before there's a bunch of draw more drawings added. Mm -hmm. um, and that worked out really well for us. Um, and then they would send in their first passive in-betweens. They usually um, breakdowns too. Breakdowns, yeah. We do keys and breakdowns um, if it was really needed. Because mm -hmm. um, the breakdowns would help inform how the play the animator was planning on getting from one pose A to pose B. Um, and if we found something wasn't working, we could um, quickly give a note for that. Um, but yeah, here I think for well, the style. This I think here we can also talk some of about the style because PP's animation in the film goes from very fluid, um, all on twos to um, very choppy and comedic and fast paced. You can see that with the demon here. I drew the demon only like three or four times fully, and then I kind of just moved stuff around and made him super snappy, like him like screaming. That's just like two frames. That's just him moving mm. up and down, and then him slapping. The princess. I think I only do the hand pose up and in between, and then I the slapping pose where he smashes the the rat, and then I from there I just like morphed stuff around a bunch to save on time and also kind of push the comedy. Like you see how quickly he comes out. These are just that's just two drawings. Yeah. So another thing with this, um, it's this was one of our most complex shots, mainly like because of cleanup. Um, there's so many characters um, and we had so little time, so we had to get like four people on at a time 
And when you're working with a character that is this big, and a character <laughs> that is yeah, that had, it had a lot of staging, like yeah, that problems is this we big. had to fix. Yeah. Then um, sometimes when multiple animators are working on multiple like different computers and different harmony files, the line width will vary, and it, they won't when you put them together, they won't cohesive. So something that we found was super essential and super helpful is that if you line somebody with the pencil tool, you can just go in later and manually edit the um, the the line width of the character. So if the lines were too thick from somebody's file, we could just go in and select all of them and make them thinner, which was so incredibly helpful because our the brush that I designed for this film kind of had a lot had a lot of variation between people's tablets. We weren't sure why, but um, it's mm -hmm. just their pressure, pressure sensitivities for whatever tablet they had. So being able to go in like quality control that line width um, was amazing. Also, just, that's not a great that. example, but <laughs> um, yeah, just being able to like so easily control the lines. Um, that was very important for us. It's one of the benefits of using uh, the pencil tool for doing it lines and characters instead of the brush tool is it gives you a little bit more flexibility yeah. to adjust things afterwards. I agree. I would say for people making a film in Toon Boom, um, do your line work with the pencil tool. The yeah, brush tool is, pencil, yeah. I use the brush tool a lot for rough animation because um, I find it has more of that bitmap like um, mm -hmm. feel I'm, I'm used to when drawing on paper. But as the, the another reason to use the pencil tool is that it has um, less like information for the program to have to process. It makes your files lighter. Um, so it's, it's just very convenient when you're working with these massive files. Like the fact that this can even play is kind of a miracle. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. <laughs> it has yeah. a lot of information. It, like just look at all this effects stuff. It's, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of oh, speaking of effects, let me turn that on too. This uh, effects were done by, the demon was cleaned up um, by Ollie Smallwood. Um, he also did the the chameleon, which did a fantastic job. Um, PP was cleaned up by um, Janessa Elde. And for some reason, I can't get PP to turn on right now. I'll try again in a sec. Um, he was working this morning, but I don't, I don't know what happened there. I can get a sword though. <laughs> but um, then um, for effects, but effects was Marlo White and uh, they absolutely killed it with a shot. Um, let's see. There was a lot of effects in this shot. Um, all the candles. Mm. Um, they all, lighting. Uh, yeah, lighting. I mean, like, they also comped, like, their own, like, lighting in this shot, too, for the effects. Yeah, and, because of the camera movements and stuff yeah. as well that could not have been done in After Effects. Yeah, right now we have this that through a render preview node. Um, to keep the file size down, usually we just click on the render preview to actually see what that looks like. Um, and there you can see the little glow that she added as well. But uh, there were a ton of here. I'll just play it with uh, when you can see the effects. Yeah, from the zap to the smokes and the candlelight. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a very ambitious scene. It is. <laughs> it's one of those where it, in the boarding process, we knew it would be a, a bit of a nightmare. Which is why I was the one animating it, because I didn't want to do this to anyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, Polo animated this in like, it, it, what, it's a, like, it's a close to a 40 second shot, including the parts after this. This doesn't have the uh, chameleon blinking and PP walking away. Um, but Polo animated this in like three weeks, which is absolute insanity. But um, other than that, we also had the princess flyer. And here you see that her, um, let's go over here. You don't see her face on this. Uh, that's not something we did in post. We actually did that in Toon Boom as well through the LP animation process. And all we did was we imported the a flat PNG of her. Um, and then we used, I believe it was the envelope tool. Let me double check that. Yeah, we applied these uh, control points to it. And all we had to do is use these control points to morph and, and squash it around. And that's how we ended up animating it. <laughs> how, how that's very right, clever. It worked out really well. Um, yeah. So I can see that we're going a little bit over time. I wanted to ask uh, you both briefly, uh, do you have any advice for any other artists who are interested in creating their thesis films? Yes. Um, some of my main bits of advice is, advice is to um, 
be decisive. That was a learning curve for me too. Um, as a director, you're the one who's supposed to have the answers and they will, the questions will be incredibly specific. Like, oh, for this scene, what should the roughs look like to be cohesive with the background style, stuff like that? Like you need to have an answer for that. And if you don't have an answer, it's great to have somebody you can talk to to figure that out. Sometimes you won't always have the answer, um, but, but know what you want um, so that you can direct people. Um, if you can't decide what you want, your film is not gonna be cohesive. Um, and other than that, um, it's really important to keep in mind that um, like the context of the production, like it, especially as a student film, people have classes, people have jobs, people have a life outside of the film. You're not, they're not getting paid for it. There's no like, you shouldn't expect them to have a very like inherent sense of obligation. People will, some people have more obligation than others and that's fine. So uh, you have to, to keep in mind that you can't like always expect like people to just drop everything for your film. Um, remember that people have lives um and stay nice yeah i think a big part was to constantly be enthusiastic to not like i would never like i would never wanted to like make anyone feel bad about not being able to get anything done or not being able to be on time for something because we do respect their time and their help so much like we were so grateful for every help we could have gotten so a lot of the things when people i like, couldn't finish something because they had other like other obligations jewel and i would like jump in and like finish it for mm -hmm. them because I feel like that's the least we can do in a setting like this, where it's unpaid work like this. Um, and something that I didn't anticipate um, was just how much social energy it takes to run a uh, production, um, especially on the scale PB ended up being. Um, so um, make sure you take time for yourself in these films. Like for me, like I spent all day on Discord answering like 20 DMs a day and in the server trying to help manage stuff. And um, big thanks to my producer, Brooke, um, Brooke Heishman and my co-producer Zoe, um, Mark Parkinson, because they helped me so much. Um, but um, I, I like could not like answer like social discord messages after that. Like I, I was just like, I have to, I can't even answer texts. Like just, I just need to take this time for myself. And it's important to like know your limits with that kind of stuff. Uh, because it's not if you're making a film it's not just the art part of it there's there's the politics of the film there's having to interact with a lot of different personalities and um being really social and tons of problem solving so much problem, problem solving yeah so much problem solving so um keep that in mind and um in the beginning you're gonna be very ambitious like don't be afraid to to cut some corners and um be realistic about what is actually achievable no, that's great advice. Uh, so I, I want to ask one last question, which is where can our audience watch Legend of Pee Pee and where can they find more of your work from around the web? Um, so they can watch Legend of Pee Pee on YouTube. Just um, look up the Legend of Pee Pee. <laughs> yeah, just type in Legend of Pee Pee. Um, it's on my YouTube, um, Papa Julia. That's also what my um, Twitter and Instagram is. And then, and then um, my Instagram is vupol, V-U-P-O-L, my Twitter, um, DeviantArt, and um, pretty much anywhere else, Tumblr too, is all Polovy, which is P-O-L-L-O-V-Y. And yeah, that's where you can find my work. And if you want to see my work on the film, for example, you can also check out my website, which is polovy.art. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us for today's live stream, Julia and Polo. And if our audience enjoyed learning about Legend of Pee Pee, we have articles on two other thesis films produced by students in the SCAD animation program. Uh, we have an article with Andrew Stadler on Beacon and Nico Pilarschik uh, Tales on The Pope's Dog. They're both excellent uh, student films. And next week, we'll be hosting collaboratory with Mike Morris and special guest artist Aaron uh, Pass, so you won't want to miss it. Thank you so much for tuning in, and be sure to join us next time.